The Netherlands has been famous for its naval prowess since all the way to the time of the Frisians, when they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Vikings on the sea, and perhaps even had a hand in starting the British Royal Navy, although that's a little overblown. We know from the War of Independence against the Spanish that it was on the sea that they were most successful, and they even went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Brits for quite some time during the 17th and 18th centuries on the waves as well. However, in 1940, when the Germans invaded the Netherlands, the Navy didn't really get to play much of a part because, well, the Germans shared a land border. And after several days of hard fighting, the Dutch army surrendered to the Germans. However, much of the navy was able to escape from the Netherlands over the sea to the United Kingdom, where they would continue the fight under British services. But before that, a quick word from our sponsor, Call of War. Call of War is a free online PvP strategy game, in which you can choose a country that actually fought in the Second World War and take the helm. This is together with up to a hundred other players in real time, in games which can take weeks to complete. Use many of your units and secret weapons to build your army. This includes tanks and planes and larger weapons, but crucially for this video and something that I like, also includes submarines and the fleet, so you can have your own go at taking on the enemy. You can declare war on your neighbours or forge alliances with the other players that are in the game. The great feature is that you can play on the same account on both PC and mobile. And for special viewers of this channel, you get an exclusive gift. If you click on the link in the description, you get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription entirely for free. The offer is only available for 30 days, so do check it out and try out Call of War. Even though the Netherlands itself had been occupied, its largest colony of the Dutch East Indies was still independent, and there was also a fleet stationed there. And as 1940 and 1941 wore on, the likelihood of a war against the Japanese became more and more certain. And so the Dutch prepared to fight a new enemy, this time in the Pacific. Now, of course, this would all come to a head in 1941 with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and the response of the Allies to this. The Japanese would also come and attack the Dutch East Indies, conquering it as well and destroying much of the Dutch and other Allied fleets at the Battle of the Java Sea in which most of the Netherlands ships in the Pacific would be sunk. However, there was another force that would continue to fight against the Japanese in the Pacific, and that was the Dutch Naval Submarine Force, the Onderzee Boote, to use the Dutch term. And when it comes to Dutch submarines in the Second World War, there is one name that sticks out above all the others, and that is a certain individual called Konrad Helfrich. So in today's video, let's find out about Dutch submarines in the Second World War in the Pacific and about Konrad, ship a day, Helfrich. Konrad Helfrich was born in 1886 in Semarang on the island of Jaffa, at that point a part of the Dutch East Indies. Now, as you might be able to tell from his name and complexion, he was not a native Indonesian. He was born to Dutch parents and his father had actually been a military man in the KNIL, or the Koninklijk Nederlands Indies Leger, basically the Dutch army that was stationed in the Dutch East Indies. However, in 1907, Konrad would leave his native land and go to the Netherlands, there to enlist in the Navy. And he would work his way up the ranks to the point where in 1939 he would be sent back to the Dutch East Indies, but this time to go and command all the Dutch naval forces in the Indies itself. Now at the time, he realized that the Japanese were gearing up for a war in the Pacific. They had already invaded China and they were eyeing up several other islands as well. It was his idea to greatly enhance the Dutch Navy that was in the Pacific at the time and build many new ships so that they would be able to fight back against the Japanese. However, when the time came that the Japanese declared war and attacked, the Dutch Navy that was in preparation was not at all ready, and so the Dutch had to make do with the ships that they had. In 1941, Helfrich, who is shown here on the left, was appointed to the top command position of the Abdacom, that is the American, British, Dutch, Australian commanding force, a grouping together of allied naval forces so that they might better be able to counter the attacks of the Japanese. His approach was an incredibly offensive one. He wanted to go out and meet the Japanese head-on to blunt the force of their attack and not sit back and wait for them to attack. 
They did this at the Battle of the Java Sea. However, in this battle, they were grievously defeated by the Japanese. Many of the ships were sunk, and the subsequent ships that were able to escape, many of those were sunk later in the, in the Battle of the Sunda Strait. Now, while the Dutch and many of the other allies had lost many of their ships in this battle, the Dutch still had one force that they could count on, and this was their force of submarines. Now, when it comes to the submarines, the Dutch had 15 stationed in the Pacific. The Netherlands had actually been fairly innovative when it came to submarine warfare, already investing in a fleet since 1905, although all the submarines still in service were the oldest ones were from 1920. Although having said that, some of them were in quite poor shape, many of them were in need of further testing, and a lot of them didn't have very many torpedoes at all. However, while that is the case, some of the submarines were actually actually really quite modern for the time and could pack a serious punch as they would find out when they went into combat against the Japanese. So just something about the names of several uh, submarines. For the most part throughout Dutch history, the submarines that were sent to the Pacific had a K, which stands for colonial or colonial, um, in front of the name to show that it was one of the submarines that was going to the colony. There is also another type of submarine that started to be built, which uh, had the letter O in front of the name and then a number and the O obviously stands for Onderzeeboot which is the Dutch word for submarine. Now most of the commanders of these submarines were from the aristocratic old monarchist leaning Dutch aristocracy. These were guys that often had been born in the Netherlands or if not they were like Konrad born to Dutch parents in Indonesia. The crews in contrast were mixed between Dutchmen most of them from Indonesia itself and native Indonesians of various ethnicities, although there was a degree of segregation on board the submarines. Now in 1941, the Japanese would attack. And so the Dutch had an agreement with the British because the British had barely any submarines in the Pacific to defend their colonial possessions, that they would give around half of their fleets, so seven submarines to the British during this time so that they might use them against the Japanese. This left the Dutch with eight submarines when the Japanese started to attack. However, by 1942, the British had really been pummeled by the Japanese at places like Singapore, Hong Kong, and the Japanese would move into Malaya and Burma. So during this time, the British gave back those submarines to the Dutch so that they would once again have their starting total of 15 submarines with which to fight. What I'd like to do now is zoom in on a few of the more notable submarines that fought against the Japanese in the Pacific by going on a case-by-case -case basis. Let's begin with O-16, possibly the most accomplished of the submarines used by the Dutch in the Second World War. Now, the O-16 was quite a unique sh submarine. It had been built in 1936, it had been completed then, and it was actually four meters longer than the standard most recent type of the K-type of submarine. It was also 130 tons heavier, and yet it was still faster. This was probably because the hull was shaped somewhat differently and used a higher quality German steel. The submarine was commanded by the overall commander of the Dutch submarine fleet, which was Anton Bussemacher. And by the time that war was declared between the Dutch and the Japanese in December of 1941, the O-16 was out on patrol in the South China Sea when they spotted a Japanese ship and decided to follow it. Now, it's important to put this in its chronological context because war was only declared on the 9th of December. And already on the 11th of December, this Dutch submarine was out looking for Japanese ships. And that was when they found one. They launched three torpedoes against it, but because of the bad weather, they couldn't see whether they had found their mark. However, the following day on the 12th of December, they spotted the troop ships once again and saw that they were making their way towards Patani in the island chain of Malacca. It was at this point that a crucial decision had to be made by Bussemacher because the bay that the Japanese troop ships had sailed into was too shallow for the submarine to dive and of course to be secure against ship attacks. This also meant the Japanese thought that they were safe in this harbour. So Bussemacher did an unprecedented move which was not to dive at all. 
he snuck into the harbour on the O-16, with the O-16 still above water to be able to get close enough to launch his torpedoes. And when he did, they were devastating. His shots found their mark, and three Japanese troop ships, the Tozan Maru, Asosan Maru, and Kinka Maru, all of which were around 9,000 tons, were successfully sunk by his assault. The news was broadcast around the world at the time. Finally, the seemingly invincible Japanese had suffered some kind of defeat at sea. It also reached his young son, Henk, who at that time was still a little boy in the Dutch East Indies. But unfortunately for Anton Bussemaker and for all involved, of only a week later on the 16th of December, the O-16 would run into a minefield. It hit a mine, the mine exploded, and all hands on the ship were lost, apart from one man who managed to escape from the sinking submarine and swam an incredible 35 hours to get to safety. Now, despite Anton Bussemaker being such a successful commander and having inflicted a heavy loss on the Japanese when other allied submarines in the Pacific had failed to do so up until that point, for years afterwards, it was assumed that Bussemaker had actually run into a British minefield and that a British mine had sank the O-16. However, his son, Henk, who would go on to become very interested in his father and the Dutch submarines in the Second World War, would constantly defend him and say that this wasn't the case because he was far too good a commander. And interestingly enough, in 1995, a Swedish diver found a wreck in the South China Sea that he thought must have belonged to the O-16. And when further divers went and explored the wreck, it did in fact prove to be the O-16, and it was not at a British minefield. So he had not run into a British mine. Bussemaker's reputation was restored and they managed to bring back the captain's wheel from the wreck and finally give some peace to his son Henk who had stood in his father's corner for all those years publishing a biography and thus trying to save his father's honour in that regard. So in some way the story of the O-16 uh, has now come to a good end after all those years. The K-17 was somewhat older than the O-16 and was of a different model the model being the K-14 class of Dutch submarines. It was also slightly shorter than the O-16. It came in at around 73 meters in length, its tonnage being around 870 when it was surfaced and around 1,000 when it was submerged. It was built at a shipyard in Rotterdam, the shipyard Wilton Feyenoord, Feyenoord, of course, now being the name of the biggest football team to come from Rotterdam. And it was launched in 1932, making its way to the Dutch East Indies in 1935. So it was there when the Second World War broke out. Before the start of hostilities against Japan, it had been tasked with tracking merchant ships against raiders in case the war broke out and they would make easy prey for any Japanese ships or submarines in the area. They were also obviously looking out for German ships and German submarines because they were of course already at war with the Germans during this point, making their way across both the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. After leaving the Gulf of Siam in December of 1941, the K-17 hit a Japanese mine from a minefield that had recently been laid and it sank. The entire crew of 36 perished uh, and it has now disappeared from the sea bottom. There is only a marking on the, the seabed to show where the wreck once was, although the wreck had been discovered in 1978. Now the reason why I've included this one is because there are several conspiracy theories that surround the K-17 and that it had allegedly seen the Japanese fleet moving towards Pearl Harbor and tried to warn the Americans. And that the reason it was sunk was not because it hit a Japanese mine, but because the British had sunk it. These conspiracy theories center on an individual called Christopher Creighton, who was an old officer from MI5, the British Secret Service. And it was on his intelligence that he said that this submarine had seen the Japanese fleet moving towards Hawaii and Pearl Harbor, which of course was the incident that brought the Japanese into the war. 
According to him, the British decided to sink the K-17 to stop them from leaking the news to the Americans. Because, of course, the British, who were holding on for dear life in Europe at the time, wanted the Americans to join the Second World War, while the Americans were strongly isolationist and majority public opinion was against joining the Second World War against either the Japanese or against the Germans in Europe. Creighton claims that he himself was personally responsible for the sabotage and the sinking of the K-17 on a an order that came from both Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, and the American President Roosevelt, as well as that it had the blessing of the Dutch Queen Wilhelmina. He also claims to have personally informed the Queen of the situation once it had happened. However, when the wreck was found in 1978, four years later in 1982, divers went down and investigated the wreck, and it seemed based on the hole and the impact on the submarine that it had been blown up from the outside by a mine and not an explosion from the inside. In 1991, a Japanese marine officer called Kitazawa came forward and said that he, on his ship, the Tatsumiya Maru, a few days before, so around the 6th of December 1941, had indeed laid a minefield in exactly the area where the submarine had sunk. Based on that information, Creighton's claim seems outlandish and untenable. But yet, it remains a very interesting theory and one that, well, perhaps in many of the decisions that occurred in that desperate time in the Second World War, isn't too hard to believe. O-21 was the first of a new line of submarines being built in the Netherlands, the O-21 line, which was built and finished in 1937 at Flissingen in Zeeland. Now, this was one of the submarines that was stationed in the Netherlands when the Germans invaded. And despite not being entirely ready to go, it still managed to get out of port before the Germans invaded Zeeland, partially also because Zeeland was the last area of the Netherlands to capitulate, holding out a few more days than the rest of the country, and so it was able to escape to Great Britain, where it took part in naval exercises to defend Britain against the attacking Germans. Now, the O-21 was almost a 1,000 tons above water and almost twice that underneath the water, coming in at around 80 meters in length. I've decided to look at the O-21 specifically because it is one of the submarines that traveled the furthest, the Dutch submarines that went around the world at least once during the Second World War, and it also had a very high kill count, sinking ships of several different nationalities and in almost every ocean in which the Second World War was fought, which is quite a cool fact in and of itself. After a somewhat unsuccessful stint in the North Sea and the Atlantic, the British and Dutch naval authorities agreed that it would be sent to the British base in Gibraltar, and that was when the O-21 really came into its own. The O-21 would go on to destroy several Italian ships, merchant ships, steamships, and schooners that were traveling in the Mediterranean. They would also sink a French ship, the Qued Equium, because, of course, France was part of the enemy at that time. However, its real coup de grace would be at the very end of November, when on the 28th, of November 1941, it would become one of only 14 Allied submarines during the entire war to take down a German U-boat. Luck was on the O-21 captain's side. Jan von Dulm, who had spotted a German U-boat which was on patrol around the Mediterranean looking for the far more numerous British submarines. Now, because of its shape, the O-21 did not conform to the normal shape of British submarines. And so, the German commander of the U-895, which was the German Unterseeboot, so you can see the linguistic link, Unterseeboot, Unterseeboot, uh, he hesitated before firing on the Dutch submarine because perhaps it was a Spanish submarine or of another power which could cause a diplomatic incident or maybe even a German one. The German commander sent a signal to the O-21 which he did not know was a Dutch submarine and asked if they would identify themselves. However, in somewhat of a rue de guerre, Jan van Dulm did not reply or he did but the reply came in the form of two torpedoes, which both hit the U-95 and incapacitated it. 
Now that might seem like it was a little bit unfair, but the Germans had also invaded the Netherlands after promising not to do so, and that was also unfair. So I think Jan van Dilm, he really acted in, a, in an understandable way. While the first torpedo may not have hit its goal and exploded some way off, the second one reached right into the propeller of the U-95, and this resulted in the sinking of the submarine. Although the crew was able to get out something which was celebrated as a major success, not only for the Dutch submariners involved, but the whole Allied cause, as so few U-boats had actually been destroyed at that point in the war. After returning to Britain for repairs for the remainder of 1941, they went in 1942 to Colombo, the uh, base of operations in Sri Lanka, and then went and uh, engaged the Japanese, uh, mostly merchant ships that were bringing supplies to and from the army, and Japan uh, in the Pacific Ocean, sinking two of them um, of around 10,000 tons in total. From the back end of 1943, the O-21 would be stationed in Fremantle in Australia, where several other Dutch submarines would be placed under um, American command. Um, and then after that, they would go on to the United States via Newfoundland and Halifax. Although in February of 1945, they went back in the direction of Australia and finished the war operating from Fremantle. The K-14 was also the first of a new line of submarines that had been commissioned by the Dutch, being finished in 1930 and crossing from the Netherlands over to the Dutch East Indies in 1934. It was stationed on the island of Borneo, where the Dutch expected that a Japanese attack would occur and they were in fact correct. One of the first Japanese attempts against the Dutch East Indies was in fact around Sarawak, which is near Borneo. And so on the 23rd of December 1941, whilst surfaced off the coast of Sarawak, it had a chance encounter with a Dornier Do 24, which was a kind of flying boat. Imagine a plane that can also go in the water. Now this was one of the Dutch East Indies Air Force, and they had seen a Japanese convoy steaming towards Borneo. And so they were able to give the location to the K-14, which sent out and went to go and attack the ships. Now, the convoy of the Japanese arrived at the mouth of the river, the Santubong River in western Sarawak, and at around 9 o'clock that evening, the K-14 caught up with the ships and torpedoed four of them, the Katori Maru, the Hiyasho Maru, and the Hokkai Maru were all brought down, and two others, Tonan Maru and Nichiran Maru, were both damaged. The Hokai Maru was incredibly heavily damaged and was grounded to avoid it actually fully sinking, but it was later able to be resurfaced and repaired by the Japanese. Yet this had been an incredibly successful attack and helped to stunt the invasion, at least for the time being. Unfortunately, the K-14 had no more torpedoes and so had to go back to Surabaya to restock and repair. It wouldn't see much more action as the Japanese would rapidly take over the Dutch East Indies. And so once all the harbors had been denied it, it would go over to Colombo on Sri Lanka and there take several trips both across the Indian Ocean and indeed across the Atlantic over to the United States and then back to South Africa. After it had done its globe trotting around these areas on various missions to stop the Germans who were plaguing American and British and further allied shipping in the Atlantic, it would return to Fremantle where it would operate with several other Dutch submarines in 1944. One of the actions that they took was against the oil fields, uh, the, the oil rigs that were out in the Dutch East Indies, which the Japanese were using to fuel their war effort. One of the successes of the K-14 in this time was to greatly damage the Japanese mine layer Tsugaru of around 4,500 tons. Several days later, the Tsugaru would itself be completely destroyed and sunk by the uh, American submarine Data. And so in a way, the K-14 
uh, may have avenged the O-16, which of course had been brought down by a Japanese mine in this way. The K-16 was of the same K-14 class as the submarine K-14, which I just looked at. And it was also built in 1930 in Rotterdam before being commissioned to be deployed to the Dutch East Indies in 1934. So at the same time that the K-14 crossed over to the Netherlands' largest colony. Now in 1941, the K-16 was also stationed on Tarawak, which is an island near to Borneo, with the idea that the Japanese would likely be mounting an assault against the island soon. And it was here on the 24th of December that it would first catch sight of the Japanese invasion fleet. In the seas to the north of Kuching, the K-16 found the Japanese destroyer Sagiri, and with two torpedoes, it managed to penetrate the Sagiri's hull, which caused a raging fire to engulf the Sagiri's deck, and the ship started to explode, which resulted in the Sagiri sinking to the bottom. However, their celebrations would be very short-lived, as the following day, on Christmas Day of 1941, not very far at all from where the Sagiri had been brought down, the K-16 itself was discovered by a Japanese submarine, the I-66. And with a single torpedo, the I-66 was able to penetrate the K-16, which resulted in the sinking of the sub and the deaths of all 36 crewmen on board. The K-16 was left undiscovered for many decades following the Second World War, until in 2003 those uh, descendants of the crewmen that had died on board made an effort to have the wreck discovered so that it could be brought up and they might have some final peace to know where their relatives had ended up. Indirectly, this proved to be successful, as in October of 2011, the wreck of the K-16 was found in the region of Borneo by recreational divers. As these examples show, Konrad Helfrich's subs were able to exact a heavy toll from Japanese military and merchant shipping, particularly in December of 1941, when all other Allied efforts against the Japanese were going very poorly, thus supplying a much-needed morale boost to the demoralized Allies. In fact, it seemed that he was sinking so many ships in December of 1941 that it earned him the nickname of Konrad Ship a Day Helfrich because it seemed like the Dutch were sinking a Japanese ship every day or every other day. And it's true that in December of 1941, several Dutch submarines alone sank more Japanese ships than the combined navies of the United Kingdom, Australia, and the US in the Pacific. Quite the feat for a nation whose home had been invaded and was essentially fighting on its own with limited resources. While this was true, the price to Dutch submariners was incredibly heavy, and it didn't help the fact that the Japanese were quite quickly able to overwhelm Allied positions in the Dutch East Indies, thus depriving the subs of their home bases and forcing them to go and seek shelter in Colombo in Sri Lanka, which the British controlled at the time. Now, by 1942, they had largely moved over to Colombo, uh, and after that, they would also operate out of Fremantle in Australia. The Dutch subs had a huge problem with that many of them were in need of repair, in need of maintenance, and in need of ammunition. Many of the torpedoes that they had were faulty, duds often striking ships that if they had worked would have resulted in the sinking of more ships. This was partially because, of course, the Netherlands itself had been invaded, and so they received no support from the home country, which they otherwise might have expected. If Konrad Helfrich had had several more months or even years to prepare the Dutch fleet and the Dutch submarine fleet for Japanese attack, it might have been a different story with the Japanese invasion of the Dutch East Indies. However, as it was, they caught the Dutch completely unprepared, and also proved to outclass them in naval and inland warfare. And so for the remainder of the war, when the Dutch East Indies was in Japanese hands, the Dutch submarine fleet operated together with the Australian, British, and American navies and submarine fleets itself. Some of the Dutch submarines were also involved in shipping secret agents to and from the Dutch East Indies that worked against the Japanese. This was part of NEFIS, or the Netherlands Forces Intelligence Service 
The Dutch inflicted major damage, especially on the Japanese, but also on other Axis powers and their fleets throughout the war. As we can see here, the vast majority of that damage occurred in 1941, particularly in December of that month, when the most Dutch submarines were active and had been prepared for war in the Dutch East Indies. Nevertheless, they continued throughout the war to target Axis shipping right until 1945, in which year they still managed to sink 10 ships, despite many submarines of their own having either been sunk or undergoing repairs. It has been calculated by one website that I read, which I will link in the description below, that in terms of submarines lost versus ships sunk, the Netherlands would actually come in at second place behind the United States for the amount of tonnage that they managed to sink during the war versus the amount of tonnage that they lost, which is quite an impressive feat because it would put them in front of the Royal Navy submarines, in front of the Kriegmarine submarines, and in terms of the Italians as well which is a rather interesting statistic in that way, although it should be qualified by saying that um, of the uh, Dutch fleet of around 16, eight of those were captured in the dock. So that isn't being counted as a loss by uh, this, this website that has done this calculation, but rather because obviously they were not actually out, so they weren't sunk while on mission. They were in the port when the Japanese or the Germans invaded. So that means that eight submarines were, were lost, were destroyed or scuttled. So it seems that the Dutch submarine service had an important role to play in the Second World War. And where in other areas the Dutch military and navy uh, seems to have underperformed quite strongly against its enemies, the Dutch submarines really packed the punch in a very difficult situation. Now to go back to Konrad Helfrich, in 1945 he had been stationed in Sri Lanka for quite a few years and he prepared for the Dutch to return to the East Indies. Now of course the Dutch would go on to fight a war there for another four years against various militia groups, this war eventually resulting in the birth of Indonesia as a separate nation. But before that, in 1945, Konrad Helfrich himself would be aboard the United States aircraft carrier to sign the declaration of Japanese surrender on behalf of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And who more fitting to sign that for the Dutch fleet than Konrad Helfrich himself. He would go back to the Netherlands, uh, he would write his memoirs, um, after having been very strongly opposed to uh, working together with Sukarno and Indonesian independence, and he would die in 1962. But this video is dedicated to Konrad Helfrich and to all the men who served on the Dutch submarines and uh, submarine fleets of other nations in that war and men who died at sea uh, and, and some women as well, I suppose. Um, it's hard to imagine what that would have been like to be in a submarine uh, and to be in such cramped, confined quarters for so long. Uh, incredibly scary to imagine and it makes us all... Um, at least I hope most of us watching this very thankful to not be in a war at the moment. But yet an incredibly fascinating historical topic all the same that I hope you have enjoyed watching as well. All right, everyone, thank you very much for watching this video about Konfra... Oh, I can barely speak. It's been a long, it's been a long video. It's about one in, in, in the morning, but I wanted to get through and finish the video while I had the, the steam to power me. But anyway, what I was trying to say, thank you for watching this video about Konrad Schipperde Helfrich and the Dutch submarine service in the Second World War, uh, specifically pertaining to the Pacific. There were also Dutch submarines, I, I covered one of them, that operated under the British, so in the Atlantic and in the North Sea that uh, carried out operations against the Germans and were part of convoys that helped uh, Allied merchant shipping to, to get into the beleaguered uh, Britain at the time. Um, but I haven't covered those in this video and I can do more videos on this kind of topic or something about the Battle of the Java Sea or the Dutch defense of the uh, Indonesia or the Dutch East Indies at the time. Um, then let me know in the comments below if that is something you would be interested in. Anyway, I will link some of the sources and the websites that I use for information uh, as well as the uh, blog that I mentioned at the end there in the uh, description below. Let me know if you enjoyed it, give me a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new and comment anything interesting that you may know about this, which I'm sure that you will. So 
Thank you very much for watching. I have been Hilbert and this has been The History. Call of War is a free online PvP strategy game that takes place during World War II. Choose your own strategy, engage in epic battles and take over the world. You get an exclusive gift, click on the link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free.